Soma Pomrita Pasaumyo Maha Teja Maha Dutihi Tejo Mayo Mrita Mayo Namayascha Sudha Patehi Namaste. So this mantra of the thousand names of Shiva has two themes, and they are Soma and light, effulgence, radiance, like that. So the first name, Somapo, is uh, Somapa in the original. O is a case ending. It means unto him who is entitled to drink the Soma juice. Uh, now we can get into a whole discussion of Soma. Soma is a deep subject. It's a rabbit hole. Uh, there are mm, several candidates, reasonably uh, good candidates for Soma. But uh, my take on it, after doing a few years of research on it back in the 70s, is that the Soma plant is either extinct or has been made so secret that nobody can uh, you know, verify what it is. Uh, the particular plant that has the best chance of being authentic soma has so many genetic variations that any of them uh, could be with uh, you know the soma that's talked about in the Vedas, but without extensive pharmacological testing, <laughs> I should say ethno pharmacological testing. <laughs> It's impossible to know which strain has the psychological or consciousness functions attributed to it in the Vedas. So, in any case, <laughs> Shiva is one of those who is entitled to drink the Soma. And Soma is also related with the moon. Uh, soma has also a meaning of nectar, right, and enjoyment. And the moon is said in the Vedas to be a place of heavenly enjoyment. However, those who go to the moon come back again. Uh, it's known as the Dakshinaya Patra, the southern path, the path of the moon. And that leads to darkness. Well, we see the moon gets full, and then again it diminishes until it's dark, new. So... The moon is not a permanent abode. It's not a destination that leads to liberation. When in fact, it's stated in many places in the scripture, even Bhagavad Gita, that it leads to rebirth and suffering. And so uh, we also observe that during the phases of the moon, there are very predictable phenomena, like um, blood clots, hemorrhages, um, what's that when somebody loses nearly all their blood? Um, anyway, when uh, people can will bleed and can't, can't be stopped, you know, uh, swelling of all parts, different parts of the body, uh, and the resultant discomfort and pain and reduced mobility and, you know, all the stuff that goes with that, plus emotional and mental effects such as anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, and so on and so on, are enhanced during the full moon. But this is well known. Ask any hospital emergency uh, ambulance driver. Things happen during the full moon, and they get more calls, and there are more emergencies, and so on. This is all well documented. And the reason for it is, of course, that the moon represents the mind. So when the moon is full, the mind is very strong. And if the mind is full of uh, untruth, maya, material ideation, um, the idea that the material world that we perceive through the senses is the reality, uh, the main reality, and that everything else such as uh, sleep and dreams and deep sleep and even... Um, absolute consciousness are kind of subservient to it or less important than uh, the physical world. 
But of course, that's <laughs> that's a degenerate mindset, and it leads to rebirth. It leads to actually taking animal bodies because people who are atheistic have no compunction about committing all kinds of sin. So because they perform so much damage, you know, so they create so much harm and pain in the world, they have to take a degraded birth in their next life. You know, even if they've done some good things, maybe given in charity and so on, after they enjoy on the moon planet, Vedanta Sutra, the fourth part, uh, says, they go to a lower birth, they have to go through Yamaloka and be assigned to hell and expiate their impious activities before they're allowed back in the human form. But even then, they may retain a negative or inimical intentions, see, evil desires, evil purposes. And so they get a degraded birth where they're not exposed to wisdom. Their mind is filled full of all kinds of materialism. You know, like today, there's a, a big trend in uh, so called atheism, right? Atheism. I mean, the very name gives it away. See, to say I don't believe in God requires understanding and invoking the term God. You see, any negation is like that. You know, it has to depend on the positive assertion for its, its very meaning. Otherwise, you know, if, if there really was no God and nobody ever thought about God or uh, had no idea or concept of God, there wouldn't be any meaning to the word atheist, would there? Atheist. <laughs> Simply the negation of theism. And theism, of course, is a belief or perception, <laughs> understanding of a supreme being. So even the atheist, so-called atheist, see, it's the same trick as, you know, don't think of an elephant. You just thought of an elephant, right? <laughs> gotcha. And it's the same thing with atheism. Atheism requires that you think that there is or could be a God. And then you negate that premise and you have atheism. But if, like most atheists, you are a materialist also, uh, say believe, you believe in uh, scientific fundamentalism, uh, reductionism, we call it, give it a pretty name. But what, the, what it really is, <laughs> is scientistic, scientism, uh, the fundamentalist church of scientism. <laughs> so they say everything comes from material causes. Well, fine, okay, we can see that. My father and mother were both material <laughs> entities, right? And so on, back, back, back. But wait a minute. This is an infinite regress. Because if you go back, let's say, to, you know, the Anthropocene uh, period and say, well, what are the, who are the ancestors of humanity? They're also material beings. They're also human beings. Well, what was the cause that caused them? And what was the first cause the original cause that caused everything. Well, that has to be what we call God or the absolute. And the absolute has to be causeless, self-existent. Right? So we'll get to that in the next shloka. Meanwhile, <laughs> so we have several names here. Somapa, Amritapa, Saumya, and uh, Amritamai, Anamai, and so finally Sudapati, that all refer to nectar or soma, the drink of immortals, right? I mean, it's both, it's named that because both the immortals drink it, like Shiva, Vishnu, Brahma, and also. Those who drink it, those human beings, conditioned entities who drink the soma, become unconditioned, become enlightened, 
liberated. They get moksha. So amrita means no death. Huh? Just like atheism means not theistic. Amrita. Mrita is death. And we're talking a lot about mrityu, mrityor, and so on in the series on the uh, kata upanishad. So uh, what does that mean? No death. Well, it means that you identify as the absolute. The absolute is unborn, therefore undying. Everything else that is produced, fabricated, huh? sankara, the Buddha would say, that which is made will also be destroyed, unmade. Whatever is born will also die. Whatever has a beginning has an end. We're very familiar with these sayings, but what do they really mean, you know, in terms of everyday life? It means that our experience through the senses, the Jagrat consciousness, is the least important, least significant, least powerful state of consciousness, and that the other states, such as svapna, or dreaming, sushupti, or deep sleep, and finally, turiya, are more powerful, more all-encompassing. Why is that? Well, let's start at the top. Turiya is pure, unconditioned consciousness, while still in the body. Because that consciousness, that awareness, I should say, is a more suitable term. That unconditioned awareness is the root or foundation of all the other states of consciousness and their contents as well. Because the uh, Upanishads describe that when consciousness reaches out towards the sense objects, it encounters them in the form of the contents of the senses. For example, the content of hearing is sound, the content of seeing is light, and so on. So these contents are also abstract entities created by God in the beginning. See, there has to be an original cause for this. Or why is the universe set up the way it is? See, and he is the immortal one. He is not subject either to birth or death. He existed before everything, and he created the conditions for everything to arise. Everything that arose will also pass away. This is the law. So the contents of the conditioned consciousness and the states of consciousness themselves that are conditioned by material objects, such as Jagrat Svapna and even Sushupti, eventually pass away, don't they? I mean, even when we're in deep sleep at night, or if we attain it by meditation, Samadhi or Nibbana, then we have to come out of it at some point, don't we? Or even when we're asleep, dreaming, we have to wake up sooner or later, right? Yeah? It's either that or death. If we enter into dreams, it's like a coma. And if we entered into sushupti, it's like a deep coma, uh, unto death, because one cannot take care of the body. The body falls off. But this is only the anamaya kosha, the food body. What about the pranamaya kosha, the energy body? Well, that endures and actually carries the soul, the atma, the jiva, from body to body, from embodiment to, to embodiment, even in different planets or different lokas or whatever. That body is immortal for the life of the universe. Unless one attains enlightenment. And what is enlightenment? It means waking up in the higher bodies, the manomaya kosha, the mind body, the vijnana maya kosha, the will, intelligence, and intention body, the causal body. And finally, in Turiya, we realize the ananda maya kosha, the bliss body, the bliss sheath, it's called. So these are not subject to birth and death. You know, uh, they arise from the desire of pure consciousness to have an object. 
And so the objects in the beginning of Vijnanamaya Kosha, for example, are only thought forms. Shankara. And the Shankara cause various states of consciousness which give rise to the senses because of their hunger for objects. So Buddha says the six types of consciousness are ear consciousness, eye consciousness, tongue consciousness, uh, body consciousness, and finally, mind consciousness. Six senses. And their objects are uh, sound, light, taste, flavor, uh, aroma, or smell, touch for the body, and for the mind, thoughts. So even though thoughts are material, they're more subtle. And the thoughts we find, or it's described in Vedanta Sutra, uh, that when the person leaves the body at death, the thoughts are compressed into like a seed. And the seed, the overall composition and flavor of that seed, according to the modes of material nature, generate the next embodiment through sushupti, because sushupti is pure causation. Sushupti is shiva, emptiness, nothingness. So when those thoughts arrive in that space of consciousness, that unlimited consciousness, it creates what we call the world, the body and the senses that perceive that world. And the, their quality is determined by the thoughts that we bring with us from one life to the next. That's why we should chant these names and create an unlimited number of impressions of transcendental quality, because then that will lighten up our thoughts and intelligence and qualify us for a higher embodiment in the next life. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.